This episode of Stamets Say What is brought to you by Akamai. Akamai is the world's largest distributed edge compute platform. To deliver and protect your digital experiences worldwide, tap into Akamai for its unrivaled intelligence, performance, and scalability. Follow us on Instagram at, at Akamai Careers. That's A K A M A I Careers. I'm Amri Maffedon, CEO and head Stemet at Stemets. And I'm Lauren Morley, and this is Stemets Say What? In each episode, we'll meet a different expert to discuss what it's really like to break into the field of STEM and or STEAM. I asked myself, well, what is it that I actually want to do? There's no point in applying for, or I saw the point of view that I didn't want to waste my own time pursuing something that I wasn't really interested in. This week's guest is test and development engineer at Ballard UK, Kim Everett. We'll be discussing job applications, remote working, and the entry-level job market. Kim, I have a very important question. I want to take you all the way back to the moment that you first discovered the magic of STEM. What was that like for you? Throughout school, I, when we were first exposed to electronics and that kind of science applications, I really took to circuits and I really enjoyed creating PCBs. And within year 11, I'd created a money box that lit up when you put money in. It was really simple at the time, but I was super proud of it. I put a charity on it as well and um, to support children in need, to really promote a message as well. So that's where I first discovered creating things, but also pushing the message that you want to you know share with others so then I kind of explored okay so what is this all about how can I do more of this when we're talking about a levels I just thought I want to do something that sounds clever (laughs) I want to do something that might lead on to something as well that's like is a new idea or really could potentially create change in the environment I was growing up in and I thought okay so how could I do this so maybe if I use biology maths chemistry and physics that would be easy that would be fine was not easy (laughs) I ultimately had a really supportive mum who I was able to talk to saying I was interested in science was all the right things so that was reassuring to have good feedback from my parents as well. As I started uh, studying the A-levels, I very quickly found that I had quite a few weaknesses. So my weaknesses was in chemistry, and I did end up dropping that as an A-level completely to ensure that I fully achieved my A-levels in physics, biology, and maths. I just reviewed my options. I'd applied to universities that suggested medical engineering. That's the course I actually originally applied for. When I dropped down to three, I had to reevaluate my options and think, how can I still get to where I want to be? But with, with the reality that I'm facing, and this is where I found extended engineering courses with foundation years, and they have an alternative set of requirements, but they also have that first year to build yourself up, conquer those weaknesses, I had to dismiss all of my other options. That's through UCAS, it was an extra course. The thing I did was I just applied myself and you just really, I told myself, I want this, I want to grow, I want to leave home, I want to make new friends, build new relationships, and this, applying myself, will lead me to do this. Mechanics, um, A-level, and whatever, I never really conquered it at that point, but it was the electronic side that got me through, that got me the pass, as that was the majority of the exam as well. That is a great story. I'm really happy that your mom was super, super supportive. And I also love the fact that you said you wanted to take smart sounding A-levels because that was totally me at 16. But I, I went with like global perspectives as my smart sounding subject. But we should get into the what's. Our very first what, and we're talking about entry level careers with you today, Kim, is What is important to look for when applying for those first jobs? I mean, you spoke there about foundation years and, you know, choosing your university course. Let's roll into kind of careers and getting started. You know, when someone is early career, when someone is looking for their first role or maybe looking for an apprenticeship, I guess, you know, what's important to look for when applying? Ultimately, I asked myself, what what is it that I actually want to do? There's no point in applying for, or I saw the point of view that I didn't want to waste my own time pursuing something that I wasn't really interested in or that captured my interest. The alternative point of view is uh, some people just want the experience or to apply for everything and anything. So 
neither option is is the wrong option. I would lead with what you're interested in, and then if that's not really coming forward to any to anything, then to just see what's out there and, and push yourself, break that boundary, and you might discover something new and something that you actually end up loving. When generating applications, it's very easy for someone to say, "Oh, where's your experience? What experience do you have?" And straight away. In my mind, I think of, okay, what have I done outside of school or outside of my social time? But actually, the projects that you work on within your studies, these can contribute to your experience. So if you have done a leadership course on LinkedIn, if you have carried out a home project in building or a certain structure, or even, you know, constructing something for the garden, all of these things, if you describe it well and you show what you've gained and showcase your achievements in your CV, and what you've taken from it and learned from it, that can build your profile so that when you're applying to these places, you're not worried that your CV isn't very full or doesn't showcase you very well. And also employers are saying, oh, okay, so they've done this, they've done this, okay, they've not got this experience, but look what they can bring. That's the perspective that I try to have when having applications and did have at the very start. When applying for an internship, I sent off about 50 applications. So it's very easy for me to say, apply for what like you like, because you end up applying for lots and lots of different opportunities. And having the feedback from interview is helpful, but it's not necessarily a given. So reviewing your CV as each interview process or as application goes is helpful too. Sometimes you have a specific CV for a specific role. However, I have sent off blanket CVs in the past. That's because I want to showcase what I can bring to the team and actually what's on paper on the job role. They might be looking for additional skills uh, that the hiring manager hasn't thought of at the time of publishing the job description. Wow, I I totally empathize with you. I sent out, I know this because I had an Excel, I sent out 53 applications before I started getting like responses. And then I, I was able to like calm down and say, okay, surely even five of the 53 is going to get back to me. You're right that it, maybe it's a numbers game. But, you know, generally speaking, for someone who thinks they know which kinds of roles they're interested in, do you have like an application technique that you'd recommend? The downside to having a technique is sometimes, you know, a lot of employers have a variety of strategies with recruiting. Some have assessment centers, some have online tests. I kind of break down, okay, so what's the hiring process? And when I find that out, I research that hiring process. If it's an assessment centre, I'll Google any key terms I can think of to do with the employer and that assessment centre. It's not cheating, it's being well-informed and being able to prepare. Preparation is always key to success. And that's, that's one thing that I kind of try to do with these applications is just prepare myself the most, do the background research. If you haven't necessarily got the time to research the company, research the role that you're applying for more. What is it that generally employers are looking for from that role? I wanted to ask actually, Kim, a little bit about folks who maybe don't know what they want to do. I know you do lots of kind of help and advice and stuff for folks at early career. If you don't know, you know, if you're not really clear on exactly what it is that you want to do. You know, you still need to have a job even if you don't know what you want that job to be. So what would be your advice to folks that are, that are looking in that direction? I think there's two points of view with this. So if you really don't know what to do, you can ask yourself, what do you like to do daily? Do you find yourself designing Lego you know, applications? Do you find yourself playing guitar? Do you find yourself searching things up about flights and planes? What is it that you're doing? And if it's not technical, is it building relationships with friends? Could that then lead into a coordinator kind of role within engineering, within science of technology? Having a think of what you do in daily and how that could transpire into a job, just trigger the thoughts of, okay, so maybe why don't I search that? Why don't I kind of look into that? I could ask my friend what they like to do and You know, how could they see that as a job? And just talking to your peers, but also exploring what you enjoy can really help because there are lots of people that enjoy what they do and this assists their day job and this this goes hand in hand and inspires them and leads them to inspire others. But also if you're not finding that connection with what you enjoy doing and with your role, finding a, a mentor or finding someone that you can just have a conversation with 
bat ideas around and ask them what careers are current. What do you want to, you know, do the job for? Well, we all do the job to earn money um, or earn fulfillment or some kind of way. How can you achieve that? And if it's to earn money, you're never going to, it's never a bad question on how, how can you earn more money? We know that usually women only apply for jobs when they reach 100% of the criteria, but men apply when they hit about 60%. My question to you, should you only ever apply to jobs when you reach all the criteria, or can you sometimes apply when you maybe don't hit, tick everything off, but you do have, you know, most of the experience? I find the best thing to be is your own cheerleader. Sometimes you really got to believe in yourself. And if you can't find that belief in yourself at the time, what's the harm in sending off an application, even if you don't meet requirements? There are so many filters now on recruitments. And if you haven't necessarily met those keywords, your CV might get through to that person. So applying through online resources, I ask myself, why not? If you only meet, let's say, one of the criteria and and let's say it's a director role, you might want to reevaluate why you're applying, um, especially at entry level. Um, However, I know the role that I had gone for an interview at Aston Martin was regarded as a senior role, but I was fresh out of university at that time. If you don't go for it, you never know. But also you're showing yourself to the hiring manager that you believe that you can fulfill that role one day. And you're coming with the skills that you believe can at least, you know, make a start in that role. And, you know, you have to get on the ladder to start climbing it, so to speak. So it's always good to apply and push yourself. If you still can't get over that barrier or still don't want to, then that's completely okay. Continue to search for more roles. There are so many roles within the STEM industry at the moment and continuously growing. In the time that you're not getting, you know, interviews or, you know, you're not hearing any feedback, can you look at a course online? Is there a free LinkedIn course or a Google course or through other charity organizations that, you know, you can sign up to? So keeping proactive can can really help with all of the applications as a whole, whether you think you fulfill the criteria or not. Also, your if it's your first, especially if it's your first time, right, you don't always necessarily know what folks are looking for. And that that could be you. They've just articulated it differently on the job description. So I think it is definitely one of those of kind of, you got to be in it to win it, get your spreadsheets ready and kind of tick them off and make sure you've got the deadlines and everything kind of sorted. What's the protocol normally we're following up on applications? So like, you know, what is it that you would normally suggest that folks do if you've applied for lots of roles, then what? The first thing I did is, is send my CV off to a, a trusted peer and, and get some feedback. If I'm not hearing anything, it's just kind of good to check that I've not written something silly in there or done a typo that I've completely gone on autopilot and not seen because I've been creating so many different CVs or templates and that kind of thing. Let's say if I want to take up something directly with an employer that I've had an interview for, it completely depends on the vibe I get after the interview. If it feels like a very automated response saying thank you, best wishes, you can kind of get that sense that maybe this is just a blanket email and there is maybe no opportunity for individual feedback. However, sometimes the hiring manager will say, you know, if you want any feedback, please get in touch. That's an open door. Do it. Send off the email, ask. If they don't, you really want to know, again, what's the harm in asking? You know, they're not your friend. You you don't know them personally. You know them professionally. So asking them a professional question about how you were presented on the day, or be it online or your CV application or anything, just just ask. You'll soon know if they never get back to you. Um, I usually try and set myself a two-week limit. If I haven't heard back in two weeks, that means they're not getting back at all. I tell myself to move on. It's good to, yeah, just keep moving forward. If you do receive feedback that you maybe don't agree with, that's okay. You don't have to agree with everyone's point of view, but it's good to consider their points. Can you take it on board if you're unsure of whether it's fair feedback? Again, talk to peers or maybe uh, you could always search on the uh, internet about the employer's interview techniques as well and have people had this experience too. Because if it was a really awful interview, you might not be the only one having that experience. And if it went really well, but they've not fed back to you, again, there might not be anything you're doing wrong. With hiring, it's really good to remember there's internal candidates sometimes, referred applications as well. 
And there's also, you know, recruiters battling it out, trying to get their candidate recruited. So it's not always you or anything that you did on the day. You know, if you can find out, any feedback is better than none. I hear what you're saying about like sometimes the referred candidates and there are thousands and if not hundreds of thousands other people looking for jobs at the same time and everyone is graduating. If you're, for example, looking for a grad job and in all of that frenzy, you know, you might not always get replies and you might not always get yeses. And I remember the first, I think three rejections were absolutely heartbreaking. And then around rejection number 10, it was just like, okay, cool, chill. But do you have any advice to our listeners about how to stay positive in the face of job rejections? It's really easy to say, keep going. I find that having a distraction really helps. So, you know, gaming, talking to friends, finding maybe something else that I'm interested in. Say I've applied for a design role and... I'm not getting anywhere with the design roles. Maybe I look at testing or a systems role. Just keeping my options open, not putting too much pressure on myself, but also still enjoying or trying to enjoy life as it goes by. Job applications are really important, but it's always good to keep in mind your your mental health and everything else that's that's going on. After university or, you know, when you're graduating from an apprenticeship, you're often trying to sort out housing or moving back in with parents and the logistics of all of that. Doing that or preparing for that and applying for jobs can all happen at once. There are graduate schemes that open early in September and December, and that's great. But exactly like you said, everyone's applying all at once. So keep in mind during those times that, yeah, it's It can be a frenzy. They can receive thousands of applications. Keep going and keep having fun in other outlets, really. (laughs) Well, I know that our listeners, because they're amazing, will keep going and get the job. They will secure that job. So moving on to what, number two? What can you expect from your first job? And what is the shift from studying to full-time employment like? It's almost the same in the sense that you you still have a routine with studying. A lot of us won't really acknowledge it, but we do have a routine. If, if we do end up getting up, uh, waking up at nine for our lectures rather than maybe 8 a.m. to go to work, we're still following that routine. The shift is, is learning the working culture and getting to know your new colleagues at university or during your studies. You've often had time or an extended period of time, three to five years, to get to know everyone. So you're putting yourself in an unfamiliar environment and brand new environment with your first role. That's the key shift. And also finding how you can impress without overworking. And that's the work-life balance that I think I ended up really appreciating when I did start working because You'll have deliverables, the same as assessments, but you might not have as long to do it, for example, or you might not get the opportunity to to resit the assessment or redo it. I think when you first start that role, you maybe are not too sure on which to do first. Apply yourself, grow, prove yourself, get to know your manager first or your, or your team members, which, which to do first. And I think as long as you're doing one of them and settling in, trying to settle in, at least you can't go wrong. I love what you said about assignments at uni. You have some kind of control about managing your own workflow and application season. You know, the deadlines exist, but you can kind of figure out when and how you're going to write the cover letter and how many drafts you're going to send to your friends. But in the workplace, things have to be done just like to a certain cadence, to a certain deadline. Do you have any specific tips and tricks or even just like motivational hacks For people who do want to have work-life balance, do want to set healthy boundaries, but also really want to impress, how should they think about classifying their work and getting through the transition? I think of it as um, you have mental health and, you know, outside of work hours, happiness. You have financial stability as well, and you have work content. So it's like three, like a pie chart, all overlapping. And I see that as if all three are maintained and all three are satisfied, that's a good work balance. If I'm enjoying the content at work and fulfilling my work hours as standard, great. If um, I'm gaining financial stability from it, I can also stay motivated. That really helps. And also if my mental health and outside of work, you know, and family life are going well, then that's a really nice balance for me to have and continuing the network that I have with friends, getting involved with engineering societies or organisations that are technology focused. That also helps, you know, maintain that 
the perspective on work isn't everything and I know what I want from from this daily role and what I'm gaining from it and then let's say the work content is like you said you're working too many hours and that's not going very well that's the point where you know I, I evaluate you know where am I at what's what's going on is this too much is this short term or long term Sometimes as engineers, we like to do it and we get carried away with it and we do work long hours because we're busy writing the code. We want our microcontroller to work. We want this test to go right, you know, one more try. Short term, that's great. But long term, you know, like you said, it, it can get too much and reevaluate the position you're in. It might be your first role. You might have only been in the role for six months. You know, have you allowed yourself enough time? to learn you know the the culture can you reevaluate that if not is it start is it time to look to look at other roles is it time to move on is the mental health and the family side still going well if that's still going well and maybe I'm in the job for only six months I'll keep going and just try and approach my manager approach internally you know is this how the organization has always been and just ask those provoking questions so I can get that reassurance might be negative reassurance that yeah we're working long hours every day but at least then you find out and at least if it's positive you can know that you know if you apply yourself it this will pay off and that will then get that work-life balance in place but if I'm finding that maybe the the family life isn't going very well and I'm finding it challenging to stay motivated in the work content even though I enjoy it can I divide up my time now for family can, will my work allow that have we got enough test cases for, for now or for at least, you know, a day of work? And just check you're not doing too much. Yes, it's great to tick things off your list. But is there a way you can pace yourself? And it's at those key moments in life that I try and reevaluate. You know, am I applying to too many jobs? Am I working too many hours? Just try to reevaluate and, and regulate yourself because you can grow resilience and we can all be resilient, but we all do have a point where so, so far we can go and it's time to reflect on ourselves and put ourselves first um, and put yourself first. I love that. I love that advice. And I, and I think it is important to have that as a habit that you establish early on in your career and in your first roles, that you're like, this is my balance or this is what the balance is that I'm aiming for. And then that allows you to kind of set those boundaries, but also make sure that you are having like fulfillment in your career and you're not just on like a treadmill of kind of following you know as the wind blows and everything's like big then you're doing that and then as the wind blows the other way you're like going up and down I agree with you on that I think that's a really important one actually for an early career person in your first job in your first role to get that right at the beginning so then it's part of your normal way that you live your life but also love the idea of perspective and having other people help you compare notes or you know your family remind you that you know there are weekends sometimes or like you know take two days every now and then to kind of uh, relax and enjoy and do all the things that you've always enjoyed doing I think for me as well I have a bullet journal which I didn't have early career but I definitely have it now and I know lots of folks journaling is definitely blown up and is definitely a big thing sometimes there is a switch actually from like journaling as a student <laughs> versus journaling as a professional as a young professional and be like you know I've got different pages that I'm going to have in my journal I've got different collections I've got different habits that I'm now going to make sure that I track to ensure that you are doing that and then every month or every quarter you're like okay let's look back on what that was like let's look forward on what this will be like and then so I can make sure I've like set myself up for success we are going to roll into the next what because it definitely kind of feeds into this idea of kind of what balance looks like and the things that are in your control and things that aren't in your control and that is lockdown like post-pandemic jobs the job market we've got you know I have to whisper it quiet quitting we've got like the great resignation we've got inflation we've got all these different things we've got working from home a lot more as well presumably across lots of different roles so you know how has that affected what the job market looks like for early career folks but also we have a question from a listener um Holly M hey Holly who wants to know how do you not feel lonely when you're working from home it was a real strange time, wasn't it? I think that's an understatement. But it was a time where a lot of people had the time to reevaluate what they were actually doing and, and what they wanted to do. Yes, it's not always about, you know, enjoying every second of your daily role, but it gave that opportunity. And it's also accelerated, I believe, 
hybrid working and home working and opened up so many more opportunities. And as an early career, you are now not applying for jobs that are going to be in office based every day. Not all of them are like that. That can be daunting because if you're not in office every day, how can you prove yourself? How can you grow? Where does the CPD come into it? Do remember that no employer is going to let you work from home for free, so to speak. You know, the doubt they do want you to work. So home working um, can sound daunting. It can sound like you're alone, but you're really not. You know, your colleagues will be interacting with you. Your manager will want some updates from you. You're really not alone. However, there is downtime during home working and that is an opportunity, again, where you can grow and learn more about your employer, learn more about your current projects. Ask questions. If the colleagues aren't messaging you, message them. After a period of time, if, if you haven't uh, seen your colleagues, suggest a team building activity. If you're new and there's not new starter processes in place, create them, raise this awareness. You know, it, they might be on a new recruitment drive where you've started and processes might be in place uh, so yeah that's taking the initiative is often talked about and if you do do it it can have such an impact on yourself as well as others and your career as it stands some people prefer to work from home rather than be in the office <laughs> they prefer to not go into the office and see people that can work but on the flip side as well if you are in office every day or you do want to go into office from transitioning from lockdown into obviously you know back at work or full time that was probably a daunting time for some people because we've gone from seeing everyone every day not seeing everyone for a whole year plus to then being in, immersed in a really busy environment again so it's really easy to say not to have too much pressure on yourself that's one thing to have with both home working and in office but also try not to force anything Maybe don't do a round of going up to your colleagues the one day you're in office and maybe do carry out some work and have some productive meetings. Employers are really good with supplying the equipment that we need as engineers and um, as scientists in most cases. But, you know, I'd recommend uh, check out Homebase and Argos for fold-out tables. <laughs> Try and make it as comfortable as you can. Try and keep warm as much as you can with a hot water bottle this winter. And having those home comforts can, can help ease any loneliness. And if you haven't necessarily got those close networks around you, I'd recommend find a network. There's Women's Engineering Society, there's the IET, there's IMECI, there's all sorts of chartered bodies now um, to support your role. There's a chartered marketing body, for example. There's different bodies that you can reach out to and, and build your network there. Communication is now the name of the game because even if you are in all the time, there will be other folks who are like me who are at home all the time. And so actually being able to communicate in ways that whether you're in or you're not, you know, the message can get around because you're all working on the same thing, presumably in the same team or the same company, is also um, super, super important. I think the other thing really to pick up on is, you know, this is like you mentioned, you know, a couple of institutes. There's also STEMETs, like there's lots of different spaces that you can find those groups and people to kind of connect with and build your tribe. And I think that is a really important thing actually to have as an early career person is, you know, who are the people that you're able to celebrate with, but also you know, go to like concerns or issues or, you know, is it just me that's, you know, struggling to stay awake the whole day? I remember in my first job, I fell asleep on a call once and we had like a big phone receiver and it like hit the desk. And it was like, and I felt so bad because I was the new person on the floor. Um, and I was like, it's just me. And it turns out like everyone had been like sleeping because we were all out together as grads, right? Like connecting. And so no one was really sleeping as much as they should have. Uh, but anyway, Lauren, back to you for our final what <laughs> i know what that's a great story Anne marie i am yet to fall asleep at the desk but it, getting up a bit earlier was a hard transition what number four is what are the ways to stand out from the crowd in early career applications and roles kim what are the secret tips I do believe that, you know, um, like you said, with the organization STEM at Women's Engineering Society, um, the IET, getting involved with them can provide you with some real unique experiences and can really open up ideas for yourself and get things on paper. I know that with through the IET, um, I was able to volunteer for the IET Faraday Challenge, uh, F1 in schools. That provided me with a great experience, but also 
I had a role there, I contributed, I helped out with the students. And that's, you know, taking responsibility, showcasing your skill set, and also being a team player, communicating with others. So there, there are already a couple of things that, you know, are skills that you can put down on your CV. I also find that registering as a STEM ambassador kind of falls into the same league as what we just mentioned, but that can also provide opportunities to volunteer within schools. Also speak as a a person with experience within your field, which again can show that you're taking the lead in something. And you may not be applying for a leadership role, but having that initiative to carry something forward um, could reassure a hiring manager because they're going to think, okay, so if there's an engineering problem, they'll at least let the manager know and take control of that situation. They're those kind of events and things to think about. I really loved motorsport and I would try and find as many motorsports events as I could. And for example, at Autosport International, I took my CV round, even though it's kind of a place where you buy or showcase cars rather than (laughs) try and scout for jobs. But I got some great feedback there and um, I did get an email back about a role. So, you know, it's it's good to get creative um, with the job applications, but also know that these, there's fun things associated with science and technology and engineering. There's events, there's, there's the Formula One races. And if you don't have Formula One tickets, which are very hard to come by, there's alternative races um, as well. There's theme days. There's like American Speed Fest at Brands Hatch annually, um, which is, is really fun. And that can give you the experience in that realm um, and inspire you on what to put as well on your CV. Because your employer might not want your communication skills, you, your Excel skills, you, your coding language skills, they probably want to know your person as well. To follow up from Lauren's question, you know, we're talking about what are the ways for us to stand out as an early career person in the positively. I want to ask almost the converse. This is a question that's coming from Shona S. Hey, Shona, another listener. And she wants to know, how do you spot red flags from a company that you're applying for? What are things that stand out in the wrong way? When looking at um, which companies you should apply for, sometimes it's very easy to go on recruitment websites and just it's known as kind of like the job application lottery. Just apply, apply, apply to everything that you can see. But it is important to, to, to look behind the ethos, especially early career, because most of the time early career, you're enthusiastic to learn. You're like a sponge and you just want to absorb every information that you can. So ensuring that the company ethos is in line with what you believe in or where you stand is a good thing to do and it can only aid you aid your development as you know as an engineer as a professional as a whole a few things to look for is you know do they have um, a diversity and inclusion and equity team do they have events going on are they sharing you know current messages that you believe in regardless of topics um is that in line with you because if they're not sharing these you have different ways of looking at it Is that an opportunity for you to bring that in and to push that and to bring any knowledge and any kind of background that you have in, let's say, diversity and inclusion? Can you bring that and your experience and be the change you wish to see? Or do they have it existing and can you be part of that team and can you help be part of their campaigns and move that forward with the modern world that we live in now and the real world? With both of those kind of perspectives, Being the change that you wish to see can be a real task. It's very, very hard sometimes. So if the red flags that you're getting and the requirements that you want a company to fulfill aren't there, it is best to move on. It's best to not apply. There's uh, websites that are really helpful like Glassdoor that are set up for this to give employees a heads up because the power in hiring shouldn't all be with the employer. Employees should have a good, clear direction of what role they're going into and what kind of company that they're going to be involved with. If your hiring manager or whoever you're dealing with your application isn't transparent about, you know, the company culture, that's straight away a red flag because this is something that everyone should be just generally proud of from my perspective because it just makes sense to have good working culture. Glassdoor is definitely a great great website that I too pop into and read everyone's comments. Like it is important to work for companies that as far as possible represent your values and those companies exist there are all kinds of like wonderful companies driving like specific initiatives related to like social goods or environmental goods or that have those values acknowledged alongside their other business you can and should 
definitely like put this on your wish list of like, oh, I want this thing and this thing and this thing. And they should also have a solid diversity inclusion team. Makes a lot of sense. Sounds good. And I think coming in with that knowledge is also fantastic. So that brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you very much for today, Kim, for giving us all of your early career insights, knowledge and thoughts. And where can our listeners find out more about you and the work that you are doing? I'm involved with uh, Women's Engineering Society, Early Careers Board, um, and a lot of our activities are are shared on there on our social media and all of our initiatives and campaigns to help encourage others to explore STEM and STEAM. You can reach me um, as Kimmy Everett um, on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you so much. You've been listening to STEMETS Say What, a podcast brought to you by STEMETS. To find out more about STEMETS, please visit stemets.org. That's S-T-E-M-E-T-T-E-S dot org. Or you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, and YouTube via the handle STEMETS. And do not forget to subscribe to the show so you'll get the latest episode of Stamets Say What in your feed as soon as it's released. And while you're there, please do give us a review, rate us and let us know what you thought. I've been Amory Maffedon. And I'm Lauren Wally. Bye for now. This podcast is produced by Unedited.